I was also, by the way, supposed to be testifying against you in Chicago at the Norby Walters trial because he came up during our course of our undercover Crown Royal operation also. And this for the same reason, I think I think what happened was Victor, Victor told him, you know, look, I'm going to tell you exactly the way it is, the truth. And if you're if you're thinking of putting Joe on a stand, he's going to do the same thing. In other words, I don't know how much value, you know, I don't know what you're looking for, but, you know, if you're looking for the truth, you'll get it. If you're looking for, you know, some other railroad, Michael, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that simple. And they didn't even bother putting me on the stand. <laughs> well, Joe, I, I can tell you now, I didn't know that, but I appreciate both. And I, I, I can tell you this. I walk in redemption. You know, the one guy, though, that I that did get caught up a little bit, I think, and you could have done him some damage with him, was Sharpton. I know he tried to... I think he tried to do a drug deal with, with Victor. We found out later on. I saw it on uh, some news report that they did on me about this whole thing also. But uh, yeah, that, that was not also not the focus of what okay. we were trying to accomplish. But I will tell you this. We, we were surprised. And, you know, there were odd, many articles. This is public record. Yeah. Many articles came out that, you know, he was assisting the Bureau in a lot of ways. And, you know, and when, and when he got approached to his credit, I have to say, he surprised me. He said, why wouldn't I approach? Why wouldn't I assist the FBI? Look what they're trying to do. Not just boxing. Look what else they're trying to do in my community. They're trying to help get rid of this, get rid of that, get the drugs out, you know, and do things like that. Um, and he, he was pretty good at twisting things around, too. But, oh, yeah. but, but, but you know what? Look, you know, I, hey, Michael. I look at you now in a different light than I looked at you then, okay? You've turned your life around. You're a different person, 150% different person. Let's be candid. Yes. Sharpton, the metamorphosis of Al Sharpton is, is remarkable, all right? Look at him now. I give him all the credit in the world. You know, it's like you say, you give everyone a second chance, you know? Uh, bottom line is people change, and people, uh, I think he changed for the better, the same way you did. Um you know, and, and I, a lot of people, a lot of people will come to me and say, come on, Joe. I mean, Michael Francis, I mean, you're, you're talking like he's an FBI agent who worked with you for crying out loud. You know, I said, no, he never worked with me. I said, but the bottom line is um, I've had, I've been around him enough and I'm a pretty good judge of character and people. And, uh, you know, I think he's for real. And, and I'll tell you right now, he's turned it around. He's changed his life. He really has, you know. I, I, I'll tell you something else, too. I don't know your wife. I've never met her. Um, but I, here's what I do know. Uh, you were you were looking to get to the West Coast in a, when you were in jail in the worst way. And some people came to me. And you know, I don't know if you knew this or not either. But some people came to me and, and asked me if I would approach the Bureau of Prisons and see if there was a way of getting you transferred out to the West Coast. Really? And I made I made an, I made a, a formal formal request to get you out there. Now, I don't know if it was because of my request that you got out there or not, but you got transferred out there. I knew that uh, at one point. And, and the bottom line is, you know, I was also, by the way, supposed to be testifying against you in Chicago mm. uh, at the Norby Walters trial, mm -hmm. because he came up during our course of our undercover Crown Royal operation also. And this for the same reason, I think I think what happened was Victor, Victor told him, you know, look, I'm going to tell you exactly the way it is, the truth. And if you're if you're thinking of putting Joe on the stand, he's going to do the same thing. Um, in other words, I don't know how much value, you know, I don't know what you're looking for. But, you know, if you're looking for the truth, you'll get it. If you're looking for, you know, some other railroad, Michael, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that simple. And they didn't even bother putting me on the stand. <laughs> well, Joe, I, I can tell you now, I didn't know that, but I appreciate both. And I, I, I can tell you this, with respect to the transfer out to um, uh, California, I, I, I would imagine you had a lot to do with that because it was part of my plea agreement that they would send me to the West Coast. And of yeah. course, you know, they can only recommend then it's up to the Bureau of Prisons. But the Bureau of Prisons held me up. They didn't, yeah. they didn't go through with it. And then all of a sudden, it changed. And, yeah. Uh, well, look, I'm not going to I'm not here to tell you to take full credit for something like that. All I can tell you is that I did make a make a, an, 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 argue, not an argument, but a request that uh, yeah, I thought it would be, you know, in everyone's best interest uh, for something like that to happen. 
Um, you might end up marrying your wife because of it, right? She was yeah. you weren't married to her at the time. Or in Camille, I think her name was, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, right? I remember I actually wrote Camille in the, in my request. That's how that's why I remember her name, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, and and Victor and I talked about that too, you know, because he was a West Coast guy. Yeah, you know, he's he was in LA for years. Um, and he still lives out there uh, out in the West on a farm. <laughs> well, you know, you, you know, Joe, uh, getting out to California was part of my whole exit strategy with this, you know, to try to, I knew when I had parole, if I was 3000 miles away, I had a better shot of, of getting away from yeah. that thing. Yeah. And so it was, it was a major, major happening in my life to get out there. Really. It was smart. It was smart of you. It was smart of you to do that because, uh, you know, I, I have other people that have been in my life who were, you know, having problems, legal problems, and uh, were around the same people too long. And they stayed here in New York. Um, they went to Arizona. They had some success getting away, getting off the drugs and, you know, getting away from the bad people. And then uh, they came back and it was their ruination. Um, you know, the rest is, is, is a sad story. But uh, thank God it didn't, you know, it turned out better for you. It really, is. Well, and I'm glad for you, Michael. You know, I I am glad that uh, that your life has turned around, and and you you know you you're a good family guy. You got a great family, and and you're uh, you, you know you're 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 successful in what you do, and and you should be, you know. But the bottom line is, uh, I've seen too many other people uh, who basically they don't just didn't get the break to do what you did, mm -hmm. or just weren't as as in, didn't really have the the passion to do what you do and and to do it in such a way that it's going to benefit you and your family um the, you know people go at it you know half ass and they don't they don't get it done it's as simple as that well you know joe i appreciate that one of the uh one of the issues that i had with my dad after his i think his third violation i said to him dad our family is being destroyed there's no way you can make it in New York. You keep getting violated for the same reason. It's just three times already. And every time you go away, it's more of a burden on my mother and the kids and everything else. I said, let's move out of New York. We, we were able to do that. I said, let's go to Florida. Let's go somewhere else. He just didn't want to do it. You know, he couldn't, he couldn't make the break. And I think had he done that, um, it would have worked out better for him and my family in the long run. But he just couldn't do it. You know, he was just too indoctrinated and... And it ended up uh, being his downfall. Really. He, was a, he was a life in New Yorker. He, yeah. he, you know, he, old school, like my, my own father and mother, they would never leave New York. I tried to get them out of certain neighborhoods even. They wouldn't leave. You know, they, they nah, this is our house. You know, your grandparents were here. You're going to be, you know, you should be here too. I don't know why you left. But, but I yeah. left for all the right reasons and, and I wish you would leave too. But they won't. I mean, they're set in their ways. And, and you know, that's the way it is. You know, there's just no getting around it. Well, Joe, I got to tell you, you know, I, I think on behalf of all the people associated with that sport, and certainly the, the fighters themselves, I think appreciate the effort that you put in and, and uh, you know, whatever good you were able to accomplish. I know it's a rough deal. That's just, it's, it's kind of a sport made for corruption in a way, you know, just, yeah. you know, that's why it was so attractive to us guys, you know, and I know so many yeah. guys that were involved in it. And I had a little involvement with, with uh, Vito Antifermo at the time, along with, you know, my good friend, Andrew Russo. Um, uh, it was just so attractive. My dad loved this. We all love the sport. So, and obviously Davey when we, Moore. yeah, Davey Moore, when we love the sport, we're all looking yeah. to see how it could benefit us in some way. So that's just how it got. And, and then, of course, the agencies uh, followed suit, and it was just just a mess. And whatever effort you put in to uh, to really uh, and sincerely try to change that uh, for the benefit of uh, not only the fans and the people, but for the fighters themselves who needed it desperately. Yeah, I certainly applaud you for that. They're, they're the ones who take it on the chin. You know, they they get they put their heart and soul into the sport. They they have their blood and sweat and tears and. And uh, when they're done, what do they have to show for it? I mean, not, you know, you hear about the guys who are successful and it sounds, oh, wow, this guy made a lot of money. And, you know, he's he look how, look where he is now. But how, you count them on one hand. You know, how many guys really make it and, and keep it, you know, um, and get what they're supposed to be getting for each fight. You know, the, the thing that got me crazy during the, the investigation that really made me upset was these option contracts that these promoters yeah. have. You know, it's like they get it. They get these guys under an option contract and they dictate to them who they're going to fight. And if they don't like it, 
you know, you don't like who they're fighting. Great. We'll put you on a shelf. You only have so many years you can right. make a living. Let's be honest, you know, and you're going to pay. And guess what? You're going to fight for what we tell you, how much money you're going to get, you know, and you don't have a say. Exactly. You know, there's no negotiation there with an option contract. I said that it should have been abolished, eradicate them. Um, you know, and I said it in the United States Senate. I said, that, and you know what? Each commission shouldn't have a fair accounting. And, and I'm talking about a real accounting of what the fight is supposed to get, his percentages and what it means. And, and make sure that that money is deposited in his, in his bank account before someone puts their hand on it and runs away with it. Because that's what, that's what was happening, quite frankly. Um, so, you know, those option contracts are at the root of, of all the evil, as far as I'm concerned. Right. No, I agree with you there. It was all the promoter's uh, way. And I will tell you this, just to end up, you know, I become very good friends with Ray uh, Boom Boom Mancini, who was absolutely devastated after, uh, oh, yeah. you know, that tragedy in the ring. It took him a long time to get over it. You know, we talked about it quite a bit. He's just a good guy. I like Ray a lot. Yeah, he is. He is. Um, and he's one of those... Yeah, yeah, Youngstown. And I was up there. I was up there many times with uh, Ernie Shavers, ah, who uh, lived in Warren, right next door. And, exactly. and Ernie lost. He lost everything. Yeah. Ernie lost everything. He had a beautiful house. Uh, the tax, the IRS took everything away from him because he, he the he wasn't paying taxes because when he was supposed to be fighting for seventy five thousand, he got five thousand. And the, and the the records show he was getting seventy five thousand dollars, and it looked like he never paid taxes on that money. He never got the money. Yeah. But you know he lost everything, and he was a a real nice guy too. Great fighting town, by the way. Uh, yeah, he uh, was good. And and Boom Boom Mancini was was a le he's a legend up there. Yeah, they love him. I was just there about uh, six seven months ago. I spoke at his foundation, and we had, we had a great time. And. Yeah, I just love the guy. And I, next time you go to Warren, uh, if you do go, there's a friend of mine uh, who owns he owns 25 restaurants throughout that area. But Andiamo's is is one of them, and uh, he's a really good guy. If you're ever in the area, let me know. I'll introduce you to him. You love him, and the food's terrific. It's great food. You know me; I don't mind food. No, no, it's all good. You know what? I was in the city recently, and I went to. I had to go to two of my favorite places. We went to Carbones. And we went to Campagnola's and... Oh, yeah, Campagnola. I was there the other night. Were you? You know, I... you know who sat next to me the other night was Nick Pelleggi. Oh, really? Yeah, he's a good... He's, I know Nick from when he was a, a, a beat reporter, believe it or not, before he worked for New York Magazine and, and went on to greater things with Goodfellows and Casino and American Gangster and City Hall. All of that. All, those, all, all of those that he is an ex executive producer for. I know. Um, and he, you know, he's one of those guys, Michael, that when you, you meet him and get to know him, you're so happy he's successful because he's such a great person. He really is. Well, you know, you, you're happy for him. You really I, are. I, I do know him. And, uh, you know, it was funny when Goodfellas came out. And I went to the movie, I went to with my wife, and all of a sudden they mentioned my name and have my character in there, and they mispronounced my name, Franchisi, of yeah. course. So I called up Nick and I said, Nick, what am I doing in that film? I said, I knew those guys, but I had nothing to do with them. He said, oh, Michael, you had some name value. I threw you in there, you knew everybody, it's okay. I said, well, you could have at least told them to spell my name, right, say my name right, you know? But yeah, he, he's a good guy. You know, I gotta tell you, um, Lionsgate came to me recently and said, Mike, we want to do a movie on your life. You know, I heard, heard this a thousand times. And I said, okay, but you're going to come up with money for the script? Yeah, we'll come up with money for the script. I said, okay, I'm going to have Chaz Palminteri write it. And they said, yeah, okay. So we're submitting them three, yeah, we're submitting them three pages that they supposedly released the money. I don't believe anything until it happens. But they said to me one other condition. I said, what? He said, Nick Pelleggi has got to be the executive producer. I said, no problem. I get Nick to do that. I said, he's not going to write the script. He doesn't do that anymore, but I'll get him on. Is this going to happen? Who knows, Joe? But, you know, we'll hand him the three pages. We'll see. It's like a winner, Michael. Well, we'll see what happens. Uh, I, I've heard this so much over the past 20 years. I don't, I don't believe in a lot in this industry, but, and I'm not, it's not like a big deal to me. It's not focused. Honestly, I'd rather see this television show happen because this could yeah. really have legs and, and be meaningful. Uh, and it should be done. Yeah, be. I think so. And and uh, I've I've been talking to Jim, a writer, for for you know weeks now, and I've come up with some pretty good ideas um, about you know things that are extraneous from the actual operation, but that they added some color to it. I think it's going to really it's, when you read it, you're going to like it. I can tell you right now.
Well, listen, I'm looking forward to it, and we'll, uh, we'll certainly plug ahead. And, and Joe, it's always a pleasure, man. You know, it's always, uh, I tell you, it's even more of a pleasure because to have these relationships today that I have with you and, you know, a few others that I've become friendly with and to have been on the other side, it's just, it's, for me, it's, it's a joy and a blessing and something I really appreciate it. And, and you've been just a, a prince since, since I met you. So I, I, I uh, you know, I, I really, uh, and, and you, you've helped in such a big way, change my perspective on so many things. And I really mean that, you know, because remember, I grew up under a, a different influence, a different mindset, a different, oh, yeah. Yeah. and it's sometimes very hard to break, and only good people can break that, and you've, you've helped me with that. You know, and, and unfortunately, you know, sometimes um, the perception is actuality and as far as the, how people perceive law enforcement because we're not perfect. Um, you know, we have, we have our issues just like everyone else. But I will tell you this, um, my time in the Bureau, uh, I, I worked with some of the finest people I've ever met in my entire life. Um, you know, and, and people who I still have a tremendous affection for, but also a tremendous camaraderie with. Uh, we see each other, we may not talk to each other for months, or years. You know, Joe Pistone and I are, are good friends. I worked Love with you. Joe, I was, I was under with Joe for a little while before he became the famous Donnie Brasco. Um, love him. He's just a great guy. But vast majority, Michael, I'm telling you right now, trust me on this one, solid, good people in the Bureau. I'm serious. And I, I, it hurts me, especially nowadays when I see them getting attacked the way they are. Uh, a couple of bad apples. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I sat in a squad area about 25 feet from Robert Hansen. Okay. And so, you know, Look what happened there. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, can it can it happen? Yes. Um, but it's it's believe me when I tell you it's the exception, not the rule. And and the people I've met, I I um, I swear by them. I think they're the highest caliber and some of the best people I've ever known. Well, I can tell you this, and I'll end it with this, based upon my now relationship with you, and even Victor knowing him afterwards, Joe Pistone. I love the guy. A uh, fellow by the name of George Randolph, who was an agent in Chicago, who was just so straight up with me. Uh, my perception has really changed, and uh, I, I agree with everything that you said. So, hey, it's been great, Joe, as always. You know, God bless you and your family. Have a great, great, great holiday, and uh, let's stay in touch. And right after the first of the year, we'll talk about what's what's coming up, and then uh, I'm reserving your spot on the 25th. So I've got my wife's coming with me. Yeah, absolutely. My wife will be there too. I'd love for you to oh, great. meet. So it'd That's be mutual. Great. That'd be great, right. Michael. I appreciate it. God bless and have a great, great holiday. Okay. And you too, brother. God All bless. All right. Okay. Take care. So there you have it. I mean, uh, you know, Joe's a very special guy. I got to tell you something, you know, for me, this was um, uh, a very unique and um, I got to say a very satisfying uh, interview that I did with Joe. It was really a conversation that we had. And I'm going to tell you why. Joe was an FBI agent trying to put me in jail at one point in time. He was on one side of the law. I was on the other side of the law. And now we're friends. The same thing can be said of Joe Pistone, who was at one time on one side of the law. And now he's neutral, obviously. I was on the other side. And now we're dear, dear friends. And I happen to like Joe Pistone very, very much. There was another agent by the name of uh, George Randolph, who I met one time on one side. Now he's retired, we're friends, good guys. These were good guys doing their job, okay? They weren't out to frame anybody. They weren't out to, to do anything shady. They were just good people in law enforcement doing their jobs, and they're good people now. And you know, the reason this was special to me, you gotta understand, I grew up hating law enforcement. I hated the government, hated law enforcement because of what I saw them do to my dad. And, you know, my dad put this in my head in an early age. He says, you know, Michael, you can't have any respect for law enforcement, any respect for a cop, because they take an oath to lock up their own mothers and fathers if, in fact, those people commit a crime. And I thought that was horrible. Lock up your own mother and father. But then I started to think about it as, you know, you, you kind of change your perspective in life. You know, I go through the whole mob life. I'm one of them. And I had a discussion with my dad one time. And I said, Dad, you know, I never forget you put it in my head we should never, ever respect law enforcement because they take an oath to lock up their own parents if their parents were to commit a crime. Pretty bad. He said, yeah, absolutely. I said, well, let me remind you of something. When I took my oath, 
I was told straight out, if your mother is dying and you're at her deathbed in Cosa Nostra, this family calls you to service, you leave your mother's side, you come and serve us. From now on, we're number one in your life before anything and everything. And um, well, think about it. That's the oath that we took to put our parents aside, our mom aside, our wives and children come secondary to our oath. And I thought about it and I said, what made us any better than law enforcement at that point? The honest ones. And he was, oh, come on, Mike, you know, and, and I think I stumped him a little bit. I really did. And I got him to think for a moment, you know, and he said to me, well, come on, you really think I would abandon my wife and kids and, you know, purposely, you know, I went to jail for 50 years. I said, well, do you really think law enforcement is going to lock up their parents unless it was some kind of heinous thing that just couldn't be helped? And maybe it was for the, you know, for the benefit of the public that they did it. I said, think about it, Dad. I said, you know, we got to be fair. You got to be fair and balanced, fair on both sides. And you know, this guy, a guy like Joe Spinelli, who is an honest guy and a great guy now, you know, Joe Pistone, honest guy, great guy now. And I know I'm going to get some flack for this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Rudy Giuliani tried to put me away for a hundred years. He told me that in a courtroom. And you know what? He really felt that organized crime, Italians were giving uh, uh, organized crime uh, the Mafia was giving Italians a bad name. He really believed that, and he went out to try to crush the Mafia. Was he wrong at the time? I'll leave it up to you to decide that. But we became, I can't say we're good friends, you know, we don't associate it, we don't go out to dinner, but I see him in a different light because I kind of understood what he was doing now. Sammy and I, my good friend now, Sammy, you know, we once got into it a little bit because he said, you know, Mike, how can you be friends with Joe Pistone? I understand where he was coming from. But I said, Sammy, he did his job better than we did ours. He didn't frame us. He was an agent. He was out to do his job. He did it better than we did it. That's the, the bottom line. But, you know, uh, it's amazing in life how you can, you know, have a 180 degree turn in life when you start to see things from a different perspective. And that's how I feel now. You know, people have opened up my eyes. Everyone in law enforcement isn't bad. As a matter of fact, the major majority of people in law enforcement are good. And we need law enforcement. We need them to protect our streets. We need them. Look what's going on now in some of our neighborhoods. It's gotten so out of control with the whole defund the police and everything else. Listen, uh, you know, I got to tell you, people, it's always good to allow things to open up your eyes so that you can really see things from a true perspective. I really mean that. And I'm thankful to Joe Spinelli and guys like him who did their job honestly, who really tried to make a difference and make something for the better. And, uh, and actually they did, they, they did. And he still continues to do that. So very interesting, you know, take this uh, uh, investigation and think about it and know that Joe played his part in cleaning up uh, a lot of the corruption that was in boxing at the time. So that's it for today, my friends. How do I always leave you? Same way, it's not gonna change. Be safe, please be safe. Be healthy, especially through this season. We're eating a lot, um, you know, and I really mean this from the bottom of my heart. God bless each and every one of you. Have a great, great holiday season. Thank you.